Well, good evening and welcome to Tucker Carlson tonight. Fired FBI Director James Comey finally got around to testifying before Congress this morning, the most anticipated moment so far in this endless Russia investigation. The hearing lasted four exhausting hours, but that was just the beginning. The analysis is next. The partisan lying, the moral preening, the purely unsupported speculative BS you see run on a continuous loop on the screen. That'll no doubt go on for weeks, if not years, as each faction tries to get the jump on writing its version of history. Our advice, approach it all with skepticism. There's an awful lot of propaganda out there. Here, in our opinion anyway, is what actually happened today and what we learned from it. First, all those leaks you've been reading about lately, at least one of them came from the director of the FBI himself. We know this because Comey admitted it. After being fired, Comey concedes he sent a memo describing a meeting he'd had with the president to a friend of his who then gave it to the New York Times. Comey explained he did this to try to force the appointment of a special prosecutor. It didn't dawn on me originally that there might be corroboration for our conversation. There might be a tape. And my judgment was I needed to get that out into the public square. And so I asked a friend of mine to share the content of the memo with a reporter. Didn't do it myself for a variety of reasons, but I asked him to because I thought that might prompt the appointment of a special counsel. Well, second, we learned that many of the other leaks and big scoops from major news outlets are lies. In February, for example, the New York Times published a piece entitled Trump campaign aides had repeated contacts with Russian intelligence and it cited those ubiquitous current and former American officials you see quoted in virtually every story these days. According to Comey, the article was garbage. That report by the New York Times was not true. Is that a fair statement? Yeah, in the main, it was not true. The people talking about it often don't really know what's going on, and those of us who actually know what's going on are not talking about it. And we don't call the press to say, hey, you got that thing wrong about this sensitive topic. We just have to leave it there unless we're leaking to the press ourselves. But that wasn't the only lie that made it into the news cycle recently. On Tuesday, CNN cited an unnamed source to claim that James Comey would deny ever telling President Trump he wasn't under investigation. Trump claimed that he told him that three times. CNN said that's not true. Well, less than a day later, the release of Comey's opening statement proved that to be laughably false. The obvious lesson here, nameless leakers, the group that's been responsible more than anyone else for fueling the past seven months of media hysteria, often lie. And that makes sense. They're not giving their names for a reason. Maybe reporters want to take that into account before acting as their stenographers, as they so often do. Third, we learned that while investigating Hillary Clinton's private email server, Attorney General Loretta Lynch asked Comey to soft pedal what was actually happening. She instructed him to call the whole thing a matter rather than what it was, an investigation. Now that's political pressure if there ever was such a thing, but Comey went along with it anyway. We were getting to a place where the Attorney General and I were both going to have to testify and talk publicly about it, and I wanted to know, was she going to authorize us to confirm we had an investigation? And she said, yes, but don't call it that, call it a matter. And I said, why would I do that? And she said, just call it a matter. It gave the impression that the Attorney General was looking to align the way we talked about our work with the way a political campaign was describing the same activity, which was inaccurate. But wait, there's inconsistent behavior here. Why did Comey agree to make untrue statements that echoed the Clinton campaign's talking points, he just admitted he did that, and then refused to publicly say something completely true about President Trump, namely that he was not under investigation? Why did Comey make and then leak detailed memos about his meetings with President Trump, but apparently do nothing in response to the political pressure he received from the previous Attorney General, Loretta Lynch? And was this the only time that the Obama administration exerted political pressure on James Comey? We still don't know the answer to that last question, and it might be worth asking. Fourth, we learned today that President Trump talks and acts a lot like a New York City real estate developer, one who is highly aggressive and does not understand the importance of precise language or care. Comey's testimony reveals a president who is used to the world of business, where the guy on top wields absolute authority and who doesn't yet grasp the sometimes vital nuances of managing the executive branch of government. Now, those nuances can be taught, obviously, but Comey also revealed that for some reason he didn't bother helping the president with this and instead let him just flail around and then took notes on it. You told the president, I, I would see what we could do. What did you mean? That was kind of a slightly cowardly way of trying to avoid telling him we're not going to do that, that I would see what we could do. It was a way of kind of a 
getting off the phone, frankly. And then I turned and handed it to the acting Deputy Attorney General, Mr. Bente. And finally, fifth and most important by far, we learned that the Russian collusion story, the one we've been force-fed by Democrats in the Congress and their handmaidens in the media for months now, is starting to look weaker than ever. The heart of this entire scandal, the reason we haven't been allowed to focus on the many actual problems in this country, is the claim that Donald Trump deliberately collaborated with Vladimir Putin's government in order to win power and undermine America's own fundamental interests. Now, if that's actually true, Comey didn't suggest it today or even come close. Instead, he confirmed that Trump was never under investigation and offered no evidence or testimony suggesting he should be under investigation. We've also been told that if Trump didn't actually conclude collude with Russia himself, he maneuvered to protect those around him who did collaborate or collude with Russia. But Comey, in fact, declared just the opposite today. Trump told him that if his, quote, satellite associates did something wrong, it'd be good to catch them, that the FBI ought to continue looking into that. Sure, Trump expressed his hope that General Flynn would go free, but even Comey conceded that no one's ever been prosecuted for hoping anything. You don't know of anyone that's ever been charged for hoping something. Is that a fair statement? I don't, as I sit here. So let's see, where are we now? A month of shrieking hype, millions of words of ink, hundreds of hours of the shrillest television ever produced add up to pretty much nothing. We've got as precisely as much proof right now that President Trump committed treason as we had seven months ago when all this started. But that doesn't mean we've learned nothing. We have learned some things. We've seen the FBI exposed as a political battleground, and that is not reassuring to us citizens. We've had the executive branch's effectiveness compromised by dozens of politically motivated leaks, many of them untrue. We've had the media uncritically cheer on what has become unambiguously an attempt to bureaucratically overthrow a democratically elected leader. It's been a total disaster, a man-made one, and it's hard to see who outside of Washington has benefited from any of it. 